I'm excited uh, about what's happening in the earth, even though right now the earth is experiencing some turmoil. You say, how can you be excited about turmoil? Well, because we are, a, we are a, a people who, today was a great metaphor. We are a people who always reach up. We reach up and we reach out to go to something bigger than us. It's one of the underlying themes of all of our mythological literature, but especially the Bible, is that we love to be called out to something bigger than ourselves. We love for Jesus to turn to us and say, sure, step out of the boat and walk on water. It speaks to something deep in the deep, cool waters of our soul to say, wow, that's bigger than me, but I'm going to tackle it. That's the Abraham story. Abraham, leave your dad's house. Go to a land you don't know about. I'll bless you and the generations of your family. And man, it's an adventure. And an adventure isn't, doesn't equal easy. An adventure equals sometimes very hard. But we're on an adventure in the world right now. And we're seeing birth pains of what I believe is going to be a great future in our, in our existence, not just in our country. I don't think God prefers the red, white, and blue to any other flag or any other nation. I believe He loves the human family equally. I think what's happening in the earth is going to bless the earth, not just one corner of the earth. And so I am excited. I'm, I'm like anyone else. I'm, I'm concerned. I'm in prayer over it. I want to know what I can do to contribute to the growth and the change and seeing the world be a better place. I would hate to see this hour pass us by and the church make really no comment on the condition of the world. It would be a shame to us to have such a great solution, which is the resurrected life of God on the earth, and to do so little with it. And I don't want to sound like I'm bashing this, the message of favor, but I, 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 honestly, I think we would be putting in too small of a box to have such an amazing thing like the resurrected life of God. And all we do in this hour when the world's on fire is talk about how favored we are to know Jesus. Because we are not here to, to see how favored we can be in the kingdom. We are here to be agents of His love and life in a dying world so that it's not just about what I get or what I've got out of this thing, but who He is in me so that that can influence who He could be in you. And then turning to our neighbor and loving them. And so that's my prayer in this hour. So Father, how do we do that? How do we make a stand in this hour for more than just saying, well, because this is easy to do when things go wrong. It's easy to say, well, you know, Jesus is the answer. Amen. Jesus is the answer. Sing another song. You know what's going on in the world right now? Well, what they need is Jesus. And we'll go, can I get a witness? Amen. All right, turn in your Bibles to such and so. And that's it. No commentary, just Jesus is the answer. And, and you go, well, are you mocking Jesus being the answer? Oh, I'm absolutely not mocking Jesus as an answer. But I know that we are saved for more than platitudes, statements, and bumper stickers. Right. <laughs> We're agents of the kingdom on the earth to do more than come up with clever statements to people that are really masks for not knowing what to do or maybe not caring enough to do what we do know we could do. And so it's more than just he is the answer. It's us wrestling with some big ideas and some big concepts. I, I want to take you tonight into the garden. And let's go to the book of Genesis. And I, I want to take you into that moment when God begins to question Adam and Eve. And I, I think that by taking an examination of the conversation God has with Adam and Eve and with, with ultimately with Cain, I think that we can see that the heartbeat of God is to quiz us a little bit. I'm building off of what we talked about last night from Luke 2 where 12-year-old Jesus goes into the temple. This is all the review I'll give, but 12-year-old Jesus goes into the temple and he stays there for a few days. His family doesn't know where he is and they come back to Jerusalem and they're upset. Mom says to him, son, you, you, it, it bothered us that we couldn't find you. We thought you were lost. And Jesus says, mom, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? You all know that story. And we examined what his father's business was, and it wasn't healing the sick, raising the dead, though that would become part of father's business. Yeah. Father's business in Luke 2 was that Jesus listened, and he asked questions, and he understood, and he gave answers. Those were the four things that happened when Jesus was 12 years old. He called that father's business. Listen to people, ask them questions, understand their needs. Get, in other words, get into their side of the story and hear it from their side. 
and then offer answers. Did you notice, and I don't, we didn't bring this out too much last night because it really begins to come to play tonight. Did you notice that Jesus doesn't give any answers till he's done the first three? He doesn't answer anything. He doesn't get that Jesus is the answer. The answer comes way after asking you a question, listening to what's on your heart, and understanding your side of the story. And the Father's still doing that in us. And I think what happens in the book of Genesis is the questions that God asks Adam and Eve, because when God shows up just after the sin, the fall, when Eve and Adam both partake of the fruit, is God begins to ask them questions. He does not sling accusations. God doesn't come into the garden and go, I saw what you did. I caught you. I told you not to do it. I know that you did it. Here's what's going to happen now that you did it. Instead, God comes in with a series of well-crafted questions. It's not coincidental that almost everything that comes out of his mouth is a question, that he asks a question. He fires yet another statement at them to say one more thing. Why? Because it shows me that the method that God has on the earth is that God wants us to engage in self-discovery. That it is not about God reaching down into the earth and giving us all of the answers. It is about us playing a part in wrestling out the discovery of what it is that we need to understand. And we need to facilitate discovery before he needs to facilitate discovery before he can provide answers. So you and I are involved in that process. Now you don't save yourself. How could you? How could someone born into sin change? The Old Testament says you can't change your skin. The Ethiopian can't change his skin. The leopard can't change his spots. That's an underlying principle of humanity, which says I can't really change who I am. That's why we have the cross and the resurrection. So Christ gives us a new creation reality. I'm not asking to you to change yourself. Self-introspection is not about how can I change myself. But there is this amazing element in the scriptures in which God quizzes our heart to show us what areas of our life we can change in order to make a difference in the earth. 